This clinic is a uh, production of the uh, fourth division in PNR NMRA. It's the monthly Mount Vernon Clinic. Arduino. The purpose of this clinic is to give an overview of Arduino to show what I have done with Arduino, hopefully inspire you to use them, show you how you can do it and learn more about it. And I'm gonna explore offering more in-depth clinics on, on Arduino. The main questions are, what is Arduino? Who is it for? What can it do for me? And how can I do it? Arduino is a family of microcontroller boards and, and a software system to support them. Originally, it was developed in Italy to make microcontrollers more accessible to students and artists. And that has spilled over into, uh, into hobbyists also. Uh, the name Arduino is taken from the name of an Italian pub where the developers hung out. This, the four more popular, most more useful uh, flavors of the Arduino are the Uno, a Nano, a Pro Mini, and a Mega. There are many others available, but our discussions this evening will just concern these four. To give you a little idea of the capabilities of these controllers, the Uno, Nano, and Pro Mini are very, very similar. They have in the range of uh, 18 to 22 input output pins. 14 of those are digital and anywhere from four to eight of them are analog. Most of the analog pins are multifunction and can also function as uh, digital pins. The Mega has uh, 70 IO pins, 54 digital and 16 analog and other features. Uh, there are a lot of peripheral devices that can attach to these things. Uh, here's another view of the four. These are photos of what I have in my collection. On the right is an Uno. Above it are Pro Mini and a Nano. And uh, then to the left is a Mega. This gives you the relative size. This uh, Pro Mini is about, about an inch and a half by seven eighths of an inch to give you a rough idea of the size of uh, the, the nano is about that size. This is the size of a large postage stamp. The software that goes with it, the programming language is a simplified version of C, C++, but it does have the full power of the new C++ compiler. And so you can go wild if you're a very capable programmer. What the simplification does is it gives you two functions so that you don't have to worry about setting up the main function and things like that if you've ever done C or C++. So part of that package is a, an IDE, Integrated Development Environment, which includes an editor. And we're looking at that IDE screen right here. There's an editor where you type in, edit your code. It's a specialized editor in that it color codes the various parts of the language. The control buttons up here in upper left allow you to compile the program to check for errors. The little right-hand arrow then triggers the built-in downloading mechanism where it compiles and downloads or uploads your program to your Arduino, which you have connected to your PC through a uh, USB cable. This uh, software is free, available to download. It's available for Windows, uh, Apple, Linux, and, and I believe some other platforms. So it works for everybody. There's also a browser-based version that uh, saves stuff to the cloud. I've never used that, so I can't tell you very much about it. Arduino shields are circuit boards that plug on top of an Uno or a Mega, or that a Nano or Pro, Pro Mini plugs into. There are many different different shields for specific functions, motor drivers, Ethernet connections. Uh, just the most useful are called the servo or sensor shields that provide for easy connecting for all kinds of devices. Every time you connect something to an Arduino with an I/O pin, you generally also have to have a ground 
and or a power connection to go along with it. And if you look at the basic arguendos, there are or maybe one or two ground pins and one or two power pins, and that's all. So that's where these sensor servo shields come in. You notice this one's for an Uno. Next to it is the one for the Mega. And you can see these fields of pin that are in sets of three. And each of those sets of three pins is uh, the signal pin, which is the IO pin, power, and a ground. This pin arrangement is also a perfect match for uh, radio control servo. So if you're using servos, you can just plug it into your shield. Down here in the lower right is a nano shield. This is my preferred or my recommendation for most model railroad applications. You connect to the nano with a uh, small USB connector and all the pins are brought out. The Uno and the Pro Mini don't bring out all eight analog pins, but the nano does. So all 22 IO pins are available. On the lower left is a, a custom shield that I've made for my layout. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. If you you want to get started, I recommend getting a starter kit. There are dozens of them available from various sources. Most plentiful seems to be the Ilegu. They have the largest variety on Amazon. Prices range anywhere from 18 to $70 on up. You know, if you aim for something in the $40 price range, that's uh, kind of the sweet spot. Generally, they will give you um, an Uno, some input-output devices like a keypad, a numerical display, maybe an alphanumerical display, uh, breadboarding, jumpers, every, everything you need to do a number of experiments. I know uh, Cliff Akers bought one of these and he ended up with a infrared remote control of a, a train order board on his depot using the parts he got and the knowledge he learned from a starter kit. So um, this is a good jumping off point. Some of the things you connect to a uh, Arduino, there's switches, toggle switches, push button switches, rotary switches, knobs, potentiometers, or uh, rotary encoders, sensors, light sensors, infrared sensors, temperature, sound, humidity, altitude, ultrasonic, the data inputs. You can connect with Wi-Fi. You can connect uh, RFID, radio frequency links. I squared C is a interface protocol that uses two wires to connect to a number of peripheral devices. I will talk about that a little bit more because I use it extensively. For outputs, you know, there's LEDs, alphanumeric displays, servos, motors, tortoises, sounds, video screens. You can even make a DCC++ system uh, or a, um, a DCC decoder. Okay, we're going to move into sort of a tour of my layout and how I use Arduino. I'll give you a quick view of my layout. On the right, the red is a hidden storage yard, which actually resides under the main loop on the right side of the layout. Over here on the left, the, the dark blue is a yard that overlays the peninsula we're showing on the layout. I will show you several spots around on this layout where I have Arduinos. The first one is an area that I call the lower flats. This section here is the, the long wall on the right of the diagram. And there's about a two inch elevation difference here. And it's flat, so this is the upper flats and the lower flats. Anyhow, I have a junction here with a passing siding that starts up in the photo on the upper right in the upper center. And the other end of the passing siding is out of the picture about five or six feet. I have this industrial siding and a crossover right near it to aid in switching. Uh, the control panel has um, eight push buttons. It controls one, two, three, four, five turnouts. Lower left is a back view of the control panel. This is this is a temporary panel. I, it's all wired up to this ribbon cable to connector that plugs into my custom shield. So you can see the ribbon cable coming into the upper part of the uh, upper connector on the uh, shield. I have another ribbon connector that connects to a little breakout board 
and you can see the five servo leads plugged in. And these, these are plugged in or direct pin to pin connection into the Arduino. The logic is, is written so that the push buttons give you a route control. If I wanna say, activate the crossover, I push the one button and it throws both turnouts. If I push the button for the main route here, it aligns the crossover turnout and the industrial siding turnout. So that, that aligns two turnouts. It also aligns the other path on the uh, passing siding to align with the main line so that that's clear for a train to come in there if it wants to. The next one, this was actually the first control panel I did with an Arduino. This was a test of my application of servos for switch machines. Since this was done, this storage yard, these six tracks in the middle here, and a couple of these other turnouts are gone. I decided that storage track being just four inches below my main yard wasn't gonna work. So it's gone, but I include it here because this was my first attempt, it includes a feature that uh, could be useful you mean you notice there's 10 push buttons and seven servos. But if you look at the number of wires going into the, the Uno shield here, there are not enough wires to be servicing uh, 10 push buttons. And the reason that is, is I developed this uh, resistance ladder that allows me to connect up to 16 push buttons to one analog input each push button applies a different voltage to the analog pin. The analog input to the Arduino reads that voltage, goes down a, a comparison table and determines which button is pushed and then throws the appropriate turnout. And here again, this is route selection. If you selected this track down here, it would, it would align one, two, three, four, five turnouts with the push of one button. And that is the main attraction to me to using the microcontrollers for controlling model railroad is to, to allow this single button route selection. Sort of the next step was this same basic area. The staging panel came off between these turnouts over here. This area, I call the, the group of turnouts on the upper right here, the peninsula junction. And then there's two two turnouts down here in the middle that I, I call a hidden junction because they're hidden. What I did here was I developed my own network. I started on this developing this years ago, even before LCC. This basically serves a similar function of LCC, but it's much simpler. And that, that was the purpose of me creating a node board is because the circuitry for the, the network interface is on this board. So here we have this panel that has eight push buttons and there's actually five turnouts that it controls at this point or six, I should. So if we look below the, the control panel is the board that services the control panel and it's actually mounted on the back of the panel. And you can see all these wires are connected to the, uh, the pins on the, uh, the node board. That board does not control any of the turnouts. You can see these telephone cables coming off the right end of it here. If you go over to the left, the upper photograph is the, what I call the peninsula node. And that controls the three turnouts that are active in the peninsula junction. Uh, and you can see in the right end of the node board, you can see the, the wires to those three servos. Down below is the node for the hidden junction. And you can see the two servo connections plugged in there. The reason I did this was, um, this was proof of concept on my network. So that's why I split these up. I probably could have done this whole thing with one board. These two push buttons here at the uh, upper end of the uh, passing siding uh, control another node, which isn't, isn't even shown here. Now, the granddaddy of all these was my staging yard controls. That staging yard is hidden. The idea is that you can 
run trains in and out of it without actually seeing the train with indicator lights to tell you what's going on. If you look at the control panel, the green LEDs show the route that is selected. Red LEDs indicate clearance or fouling points. And then the amber and the red LEDs on the right show you the condition when the uh, car is approaching the end of the track. The amber LED comes on when it's about four inches from the end and the red LED when it's about one inch from the end. I made custom circuit boards to mount the nine push button switches and 39 LEDs on the panel. Those push buttons are, and LEDs are connected to the Arduino through these three IO expander boards that connect through I squared 2C uh, interconnects. Above it, you see the uh, Arduino Nano in one of my custom node boards. Above it, are these these four boards are motor driver boards that drive the eight tortoise switch machines. These other ribbon cables go to other IO expanders that access the 30 or so optical detectors that drive all these LEDs. So this is probably way beyond what an average model railroader might do. But just to give you an example of the power of a what you might call a lowly nano, uh, all the software that handles all of these lights and sensors only uses about 15%. That's one five percent of the program memory in, in the nano. There's a lot of computing horsepower when you're doing this kind of uh, detection and combination logic. And these relatively simple and relatively inexpensive um, I don't think I've paid more than $3 for a nano. The latest thing I'm doing is these lighted push buttons. They're called tactile LEDs, and it's an LED built into the button on a push button switch. Uh, these buttons are about 3 eighths of an inch in diameter. When you mount them on the back of a eighth inch masonite, the surface of the button is flush with the surface of the panel. So you don't get any um, butt dialing by bumping them accidentally. You, you deliberately need to push your finger against the button to get it to press. And then it lights to tell you that you have selected that route. The upper left is a picture of the back of that panel. This is experimental, so it's no effort to make it neat. Uh, those tactile push buttons, um, they're designed for printed circuit board mount, there's no way the leads would survive just rat's nest wiring that they would break. So I had custom PC board made that I can cut into strips and mount these lighted switches on. This long strip along here is these four, five that are in this upper end of my yard. And then the smaller one are the two up above, which are push buttons for the upper end of that same passing siding that we saw the two push buttons on that, that earlier diagram. And this is connected via the network. So when the buttons on another panel are pushed, the turnouts controlled by this node board here for that turnout are controlled over the network. Another quirky thing is that there's more to this panel off to the left. And, and the way this mounts on the fascia, there's a vertical brace and I didn't want to run wires behind that brace because I couldn't take the panel down without disconnecting the wires. So I used this uh, copper foil tape to connect those three buttons and LEDs so I, I could still mount it flush against the brace and not have to worry about the wires. And down below is, is again, one of my node boards with a uh, Pro Mini in it. The circuitry with the little integrated circuit a few resistors and capacitors is the interface for my network. If any of you are familiar with the uh, Digitrax LocoNet interface, this is very nearly identical to the LocoNet. And in fact, my original concept was to run this over LocoNet 
and then I decided against that because uh, I didn't want to have to bother with making sure I wasn't producing conflicting commands. This is the last node. This is even more highly uh, experimental. Down on the lower right, you see the the three push buttons from that other panel. Uh, the turnouts those push buttons control are controlled by this node connected via the network. The panel up here on the upper upper right is one of those boards I had made for the uh, tactile push buttons, and you can get a good look at what the tactile push buttons look like. Again, uh, like I said, this is experimental, so there was no mate. They're not put on a map yet. But the push buttons here, these three labeled ML6, YA1 and YA2 are these three on the lower right. The PS5 and PS6 are two more buttons that can control the upper end of that passing sighting that we showed you before. And then the three buttons down below, uh, ISN, ISA, and ML4 are push buttons for this little industrial sighting down below. This eventually, as I get this uh, drilling and getting the holes correct size on these panels and stuff, these will all be put on a panel like, like this. So that concludes my layout tour. So now we're gonna get into what you can do and how you can do it. I'll start off with some very basics. We have here a 12 volt wall wart. We have a USB wall wart. If you use this, um, Nano shield, you can use the 12 volt wall wart to power it via the barrel connector, or you can use the nano, plug it in and power it through the USB. You could power this from your computer if you wanted, but you can use the USB wall wart, it works just fine. Over here is just uh, jumper wires. If you're gonna start interconnecting these things, it, it you will want a stock of these, they come they're called DuPont jumpers, and they come in a 40 pin wide ribbon like this short one that's up here on top. They come in four different lengths, 100 to 100 to 200 millimeters, and you peel them apart. I mean, these these narrower ones here were stripped off, ones that were 40, 40 pins wide, and are color coded in the standard color code, brown, red, orange, yellow, et cetera. But you got a whole lot of them you can hopefully tell them apart by uh, keeping color straight. Here's how we could do the lower flaps junction with off the shelf components. Uh, all the wires from the push buttons to be plugged into the Arduino or into the, uh, the nano shield. The five servos can plug in in the nano shield. You could power it with 12 volt wall work and you're off and running. Here's an example, some uh, traffic lights, plug them in the Arduino shield. I wrote a little program. In the Arduino lingo, a program is called a sketch, S-K-E-T-C-H. Like an artist might make a sketch. You write a program, it's a sketch. So anyhow, I wrote a little sketch that cycles these two traffic lights through a normal traffic light cycle. You have complete control. I know some inexpensive traffic light controllers, the Sequence would go on green, yellow, red. And on the other light, the cycle would go red, yellow, green, because they save one output by having the yellows on together. This one is, is written such that you get green, yellow, red on the one traffic light. The other traffic light goes like a real traffic light from red directly to green. The other thing that was pretty simple was a crossing lights control. This is plugged into a, an Arduino Nano with no shield. There's enough ground and power pins that this will run by itself. Now, this just runs when you turn it on and turn it off. There's no track detectors with, with this one. You see the blinking crossing lights? Yeah. See, I, didn't, I wasn't lying to you. <laughs> Here's a better one of the crossing lights. So it does work. And then this this is a crossing gate with flasher setup that I made. There's four optical detectors. You see the, the detectors with infrared emitter and detector. So there's four of them. When the train approaches, triggers the first one, the lights come on, the gates go down. And when the 
the end of the train clears the crossing, the lights go off and the gates, the gates go up. And if you look there, say Arduino Nano Shield, it's all plugged together from that. And that was a custom program that I wrote for that. Uh, here's another one. This was to show you lighting effects. I got these pre-wired LEDs. I have a crimper and these DuPont connectors I can put on myself. So, so I could just plug them into the Arduino shield. If you don't want to invest in a uh, crimper and crimp them yourself, you could you could take those ribbon cable jumpers and cut the connectors off and solder them to these wires so you can still get plug and play without doing a lot of special. I don't have a photo of the other side to show you. And um, I'm putting forth this challenge. Um, I'm willing to put together additional classes and sessions to help you learn how to use Arduinos. But in order for that to happen, I want you to show enough initiative to send me an email to tell me what facets of this you want to learn more about. That shows me two things, that you are genuinely interested. And second, uh, it gives me an idea of how to tailor my program. So it's kind of up to you if you want to go farther in, in learning about this. So I'm only for questions. I'm going to unshare. I have a little... Uh... Bascule bridge in N scale that I was trying to animate. My first choice was a tortoise, but it moved way too fast. Then I went to a servo and it I got it to go slow enough, but it was a little jumpy. So I think that's probably a function of the number of segments in the motor. Do you have any any idea about that? Well, one thing is, it, it, and, and how are you controlling the servo? With a Uno With and an a Uno? push button. With two um, push buttons. Well, one thing is the commands you send to the servos are use using degrees or microseconds. I forgot. <laughs> okay. All right. Here, here's a tip. Use yeah. microseconds because the steps are much smaller. Okay. Okay. These um, starter kits, do they include uh, some servos, uh, instruction on uh, C++ programming? Whether or not they, they contain a servo depends on the kit because they all have a different assortment of parts. I do not know what they contain in terms of instructions for the projects because I've, I've not actually seen one of the kits in person, but I imagine they come at least with links where you can find stuff online. There's, a, there's several now good books on programming uh, Arduinos you know, on Amazon. People get scared of C, but if you've used any of this stuff in Excel, if you've done much work with Excel, you know, in Microsoft Office, there's a lot of stuff like if then else and so forth, or if else, that's just the same almost in C. But if you've worked with Excel very much, it's a lot of conceptually the same as stuff in C. Okay, this is a demonstration of um, random room lights. This. Um... If you hadn't noticed, this is a fancy hotel building. This is the Ritz Hotel. <laughs> the uh, the blink rate is about about 20 times as fast as you would probably have it on the layout. And I have to confess, I lifted this software from from uh, Jeff Bunza, but it, it just depicts people turning lights on and off oh. in a room. If you wanted to make a sequence like someone turning on a light in the bedroom and then the light goes on in the hall and then the light goes on in their bathroom and then they go off in the same sequence, you could certainly program them that way. That, that particular uh, sequence was just random. This is the grade crossing. So here comes the train from the left. What is the sensor that um, knows the train is there? You, you see these these you see these little boards with these two bulbous things on them. If you look right off on the on the right hand side, you see the circuit board with a black thing and a uh, clear colored thing. Those yeah. that's a uh, infrared. That's an infrared detector. So you they block the infrared. And that tells it. Uh, it, it it senses a reflection of something passing over it. 
because the, the clear thing emits infrared beam and then it reflects back and the, uh, the dark thing is the detector. So that's under the train. You put the... that under the track oh, between okay. the ties. Cool. And, I... and actually, if uh, I would recommend that if somebody wants to do this, to go to Iowa Scale Engineering they have a new product called Train Spotter, and it's the same principle, but but the sensors are much much smaller, and you drill a small hole down between your ties, and then up from the bottom you drill about a half inch hole, and you drill up, but not quite break through, and then their sensor pushes up from the bottom, and it's small enough to fit between the ties. And then the output of that, you can connect to the Arduino. They look like they're very nice detectors. Um, so once you download this uh, software onto your Arduino board or whatever, it just stays there. So it activates when you power up the board or you have to have it connected to your computer. How does that all work? Uh, once, once you've downloaded it to your Arduino, as soon as you connect the power it starts the program it's saved in flash memory so it it's there and if you want to change it you connect it up to uh, your computer with the usb port you can download a new version of the software or something completely different so here's here's a turnout uh, laid upside down there's this little plate of uh eighth inch uh, masonite with a slot cut in it this is glued to the to the ties. Actually, it's glued to the uh, printed circuit board ties on this. Uh, this is uh, fast tracks, and then the servo is glued to that plate. And then I've got these little uh, connectors. The wire comes up through the throw bar and through these two fixtures on the servo throw arm to throw the turnout. And then I cut a hole in a roadbed. Looks like this. And so that whole thing drops down from the top. The electronics are sending a constant signal to the servo that's telling the servo what position to hold that servo arm. When that servo arm is in position and it's connected, if you try to move it, the motor will turn on and try to move that arm back to the position that has okay. been commanded. And then when you want to throw the turnout, you change the command that's being sent to the servo and then the servo will move to that new position and then it will hold that position. How many servos can you run off of each one of those types of Arduinos then? Well, the, the Arduino itself is, uh, I believe they, they claim they can control up to 12. The problem is how you power them. If, if you're using the uh, shield, you're probably okay just powering them off the uh, the 12 volts, or if you power them through the USB port, you're kind of dependent on how much power your USB port can provide. So you're, you can be limited by the power. The Arduino board itself has the capability of running off of like nine to 12 or nine to 15 volts. They have an input for a higher voltage. And if you're just using that, the voltage regulator device on the Arduino is only capable of maybe two or three servos at max. Also, I have found on some USB ports, after you get up to about four or five servos, uh, you're kind of pushing it. But if you power through the USB wall wart or use the 12 volt input to a, a shield like the nano shield, then you should be fine. So do you try to use any JMRI or any of that kind of stuff to run any of these Arduinos or? Not yet. I have a... Arduino Mega sitting here, it's interfaced to the network. I use the Mega because it has multiple serial ports. The intent for the Mega is to translate from JMRI to my network so that I can interface my network to JMRI. So the, the hooks are there for me to do that eventually. If you buy any Arduino, it comes with a little program called Blink. There's an LED built into every Ar Arduino that you control with software. And blink blinks that light off and on on a one second interval. So what I suggest is if you want to get started is you go in to the blink program and learn how to make it blink at a different rate. So if you go over here to file examples, there's a whole slew of examples. 
And this one I was telling you about that comes built in is called Blink. But right here is a is a link to an Arduino uh, English tutorial on Blink. That's a good starting point would be to go to www.arduino.cc. There are tutorials and examples there. That's that's one way to get started. When you open a, a new sketch, there's these two functions. The first function is that's built in is called setup. And the second function is called loop. The setup function runs once when you first power up the board or you hit the reset switch. And everything that's between these two brackets runs once at the very beginning. When that's finished, it goes down to loop. And everything that's in between these two brackets in the loop, that gets repeated over and over. It runs through those steps, jumps back to the top, and goes through again. So it just runs over and over. So on this simple program, you need to tell the Arduino what pin you're going to use or what you're going to do with that pin. So for each pin you're going to use, you have to set the pin mode. Remember I told you I had a built-in LED? So LED built-in is a keyword for the pin for that built-in LED. And you're telling it you're going to use that LED as an output. So we get down into the program. We do digital write to that LED built-in pin, output it to logical high, uh, nominally five volts, and that turns that LED on. Then this is one of the, this is an Arduino function that's built in called delay. This is the number of milliseconds to delay. So we're delaying for a thousand milliseconds or one second. So the light's on for one second. Then we do digital write to the LED built-in pin, set it low, the LED goes off, we delay another thousand milliseconds, and then we loop back to the top, and then the LED goes on again. So it just blinks on and off at a one second interval. That is generally built in to every Arduino when you get it. How would you break that loop? Suppose you want to say, okay, we've had enough blinks, so I want to stop it. That's where you got to get into a little bit of programming. <laughs> you could add code to count the number of times you've been through and then shut it off. And then when you stop it, unless you have another button or something to start it again, you have to turn the power on and off to start it. You see my grade crossing. So I'll skip down to the loop. And you see here's loop. First function I get into here, it says read sensors and save them in array. There's four sensors I go through here. I'm reading the sensors and I'm saving the value. Everything from a double slash, the end of the line is a comment. What I'm doing is in, I have this sensor array where it gives me a value for the four sensors. And the value for each sensor is either nonsense, <laughs> which is means there's no train or anything there, or the other value is sense, uh, indicating that there is something there. I go down when it's idle, I'm testing those sensors. And if, if one of them says sense, then I start the crossing gate sequence. And then it, it gets complicated because I have to remember that I'm in the sequence of starting and, and I have to remember whether it, it started on the, coming from the right or the left. And that's what this logic does. When you're looking at IDE screen, there's the two areas of setup and the loop, but there's also this area above it where you set uh, global variables and do defines and things like that. Anybody who writes in C or a lot of other languages where you have to declare variables, this is generally where you do it. Uh, I can find that one. It's got some good basic stuff in it. Where's many of your best sources for finding those? Used to be eBay. And now with the changes in your trade situations and stuff with China and, and changes on eBay, I'm finding it as, almost as good luck to get stuff off of Amazon. Two other sources that I use are uh, AliExpress. You're familiar with them? And the other one that is deteriorated as a source of electronic parts is Banggood. They've got more into kitchen utensils and not so much in electronics. Does Arduino basically run just C? It's a standalone controlling device. So you're, you're not going to put a, 
operating system like Linux or Windows on it. The basic Uno, Nano, Pro Mini, they only have 32,000 bytes of program memory. I don't even think you can get a program on Windows that'll open that's only 32K. But conversely, the, the IDE will run in, in all those platforms. I run, I run it on Linux. So yeah, I bought one of those kits and it's from a place called Dr. Duino Explorer. It came with this board. I don't know if you can see this thing. And then they have a kit that it comes with called the DD2-MRR Explorer Pack. So this is a kit that's, uh, and it was probably in the $80 range. Yeah. And it uh, has the servo in it and the linkage and quite a bit of different stuff. And then he has another Explorer kit that I bought that goes with it. And of course, everything's really high quality made in China. But, uh, you know, there's probably $20 worth of parts in there that I paid $100 for it. But uh, it does come with quite a few online tutorials and stuff that I haven't got to. But it looks pretty inclusive, I think, for uh, somebody that's at my level or entry level. The person can go online and look at that. And I think I bought it. It could have been even through the NMRA on their uh, brother-in-law price deal. They might have an ad in there. And I think it was normally $110 or something for the model railroad or kit. And they had it for 79 or, yeah. you know, that's an option to look at. I just wanted to let you know kind of something that was out there. And it's, and it's somewhat tailored for model railroaders. So I thought it might apply. But you get, obviously you can go online and look at that and see what, uh, what it looks like for you. I think Comback Model Railroader put that out. And I went looking for it and I couldn't find it to see what was in it. I think I would still be, still fall back to my advice in my slideshow was just to go buy one of those general uh, starter kits. and Just to get sure. you started. The possible applications are so diverse. They really can't give you enough in one of those kits where you would really want to do a permanent installation. I think one of the best ways to learn may be to uh, to find an example, get something set up, maybe something that drives a couple of LEDs or or reads a potentiometer, and and then get the example program, get it working, and then go in and and try to understand the program and change it, change things. Like I said with Blink, um, learn how to make it Blink. Uh, every half second instead of every second or and stuff like that so you start getting a feel figure out how to hook up a switch so you can turn the blinking on and off uh, one of the first things i did was learn how to do time delays so i can eliminate that delay function one of my rules is avoid the delay function because when you have it on delay that ties up the whole process while that delay is going on so while that LED is sitting there on for one second, your program's just sitting there idling. Nothing's happening. So if you're going to do something well, like my grade crossing, we had the blinking light there, but it was also reading sensors and controlling the servos, and that blinking was going on independently. So you need to learn how to generate time delays or do time sequencing without relying on that delay function because the delay function ties up the processor. You need to be able to, to program so you can do multitasking because the machine is capable of it. Once you get the hang of uh, doing them without using the delay function, it's, uh, well, at least for me, it's not too difficult.